It's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers this morning. I'll introduce them both and let uh, Professor Douglas Farrow speak first. <laughs> Professor Farrow joins us remotely uh, through the wonders of modern technology via Skype from Canada, where he is Professor of Theology and Christian Thought at McGill. Before coming to McGill University in 1998, he taught in the UK at King's College London, where he had completed his doctorate under Colin Gunton. He pursues a broad range of interdisciplinary interests anchored in theology with colleagues from North America and Europe. He takes his inspiration from such august figures as Saints Paul, Irenaeus, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, and JP II. They provide the inspiration for his labors, which have a dual focus on classical theological loci and modern problems in the church or in civil and state institutions. His most recent books are Desiring a Better Country, Forays in Political Theology in 2015, and Theological Negotiations, Proposals in Soteriology and Anthropology, uh, just published this year. Professor, Professor Michael Hanby came to the Institute in 2007 from Baylor University, where he was Assistant Professor of Theology in the Honors College and Associate Director of the Baylor Institute for Faith and Learning. <laughs> Professor Hanby is the author of a 2013 monograph from Wiley Blackwell, No God, No Science, Theology, Cosmology, Biology, which reassesses the relationship to, between the doctrine of creation Darwinian evolutionary biology and science more generally. He is also author of Augustine and Modernity, which is simultaneously a rereading of Augustine's Trinitarian theology and a protest against the contemporary argument for continuity between Augustine and Descartes. He has contributed chapters to a number of volumes and is also author of several articles appearing in Communio, Modern Theology, Proecclesia, and theology today. So let us begin with Professor Douglas Farrow. First of all, I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me and uh, uh, the air traffic controllers at DC uh, who canceled my flight while we were on the runway. To them, I offer no particular thanks, except that, of course, they were concerned about safety and saving lives, so that's good, uh, especially when it's uh, your plane. But uh, I very much regret not being with you in person. That's, that's certainly my loss more than yours, and I would like to... Uh, to greet my colleague on this panel, uh, Dr. Hanby, and also uh, old friends like uh, uh, David Schindler. And I would like to thank Father Lopez and, uh, and also our technician, Carla, who's doing the best he can uh, and doing very well with this uh, still s somewhat imperfect technology. Um, let me... Uh, Straight away, uh, address the title I was asked to address: "The Good Life, the Absence of God, and Liberal Public Reason." And I look forward to our Q and A time later. Public reason, one might suppose, is simply moral or practical reason exercised collectively on matters pertaining to the common good. What ought we to do about this or that? whether this or that is something that concerns us all. We do not wish to go hungry or naked. How shall we feed and clothe ourselves? We do not wish to be violated. How shall we keep the peace and defend ourselves? We wish to get better, to live the good life. How shall we keep uh, how, how shall we improve ourselves? Those, those three questions, I think, are, are important and, uh, and they're basic questions that we're all concerned about. Um, may I just ask whether the audio is good or should I be muting my mic here, Carlos? You're good the way you are. Go ahead. All right, very good. 
The best answer to such questions may be very difficult to find or to achieve consensus on, and even harder to implement, but the burden of responsibility is laid upon us. Unfortunately, another kind of burden is laid upon us. We have a propensity to greed and violence, not to mention sloth, pride, dishonesty, etc. And this interferes with the pursuit and implementation of good answers. Despite a rich physical environment and an equally rich cultural heritage, periodic outbreaks of severe and appalling violence have rendered the middle question, how should we keep the peace and defend ourselves, a far more pressing one than it ought to be. So, for example, the violence of the first half of the 17th century pushed us to seek new answers to all three questions. We would refill the coffers by secularizing church property. We would begin a new line of defense, privatizing religion as far as possible, religion being one major cause of the violence. And we would seek to improve ourselves by being less religious and more scientific. Perhaps then we would become less violent. Well, that didn't work out quite as we'd hoped. The signs of a problem appeared already in the French Revolution. Then came the enormous eruption of violence in the first half of the 20th century, the new non-religious 30 years war, whose pause for armistice we have just been remembering. That pushed us towards another line of defense, defense against nationalism, and a new line of improvement. We will think globally and seek global governance. Borders will become a thing of the past. Well, we'll see how that works out, but so far it doesn't look very promising. What will happen to subsidiarity, to the idea that the good is always finally a local good? That's the Brexit question, of course, and the question raised uh, very uh, uh, powerfully, I think, by the Paris Statement. Will greed and violence and dishonesty succumb to science and global governance, or will they simply find new and greater arenas in which to, in, in which to operate? Was communism not already a major step in that direction? And did communism not account for more than its share of the violence of the 20th century? But let us set that aside. In our own sphere, the sphere of liberal democracy, European and American influences have combined to give rise to a new notion of public reason, which is now something more than practical reason exercised collectively on matters pertaining to the common good. New emphasis falls on collectively, on the democratization of public reason, on the will of the people, but this will is no longer informed by a common tradition, no longer upheld by the first two estates, the noble and the clerical, as it was in Christendom. We're all commoners now, but commoners who may not have much in common. How then do we mediate our common life? Liberal public reason states the claim, as Jonathan Kwong puts it in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Quote, that the moral or political rules that regulate our common life must be, in some sense, justifiable or acceptable to all those persons over whom the rules purport to have authority, end quote, which means that they cannot embody or appeal to what is not in common. What is in common, it turns out, is that as persons, we are all authorities to ourselves. Proponents of liberal public reason, the same author tells us, often pre <clears throat> present the idea as an implication of a particular conception of persons as free and equal. Each of us is free in the sense of not being naturally subject to any other person's moral or political authority, and we are equally situated with respect to this freedom from the natural authority of others, end quote. Liberal public reason acknowledges no natural authority but the authority of the self, and we might say of itself, 
uh, Quang doesn't even bother with the qualification liberal. It's just public reason. No natural authority. No heteronomy. This means, again in his words, that rules can rightly be imposed on person only when the rules can be justified by appeal to ideas or arguments that those persons at some level of idealization endorse or accept. And that, of course, rules out a great many old rules while compelling us to come up with a great many new rules, making certain that the old rules are not applied. Perhaps that's what Huang has in mind when he says that public reason is not only a standard by which moral or political rules can be assessed, it can also provide standards for individual behavior. I'm going to quote him one more time, a little bit more length, so that you get the picture that he's presenting. If we are to comply with the ideal of public reason, we must refrain from advocating or supporting rules that cannot be justified to those on whom the rules would be imposed. We should instead only support those rules we sincerely believe can be justified by appeal to suitably shared or public considerations. For example, widely endorsed political values such as freedom and equality and abstain from appealing to religious arguments or other controversial views which reasonable people are assumed to disagree. In this way, public reason can be presented, this is the payload here, as a standard for assessing rules, laws, institutions, and the behavior of individual citizens and public officials." End quote. Now, you know, Wong, uh, as is his task in this case, provides a decent sketch of objections and rejoinders. Objections range from the concern that this liberal idea of public reason is self-defeating because the idea itself cannot be justified to all those to whom the idea applies, to observing that it cannot successfully abstain from some claims about moral or political truth, to worrying about trying to um, uh, assess moral and political rules while abstaining, or about having to stipulate rather arbitrarily those who are citizens in the Republic of Public Reason so as not to have to abstain. On my view, there is a good deal of force in each of these objections, and certainly in the objections taken together. Perhaps you've noticed that the argument here is circular. We have a particular conception of persons free and equal and not naturally subject to anyone else's authority. This leads to a particular idea of public reason, which in turn entails not appealing to anything or advocating anything that might change our conception of persons as subject to no authority but their own. Well, okay. But whence arises this view of the person? Do we share it? Should we share it? What does it do to our conception of the family, say, as a natural or pre-political institution with its own authority and authority structures? Or to the church as a divine institution, again, with its own authority and authority structures? Well, these, of course, it privatizes and sets out to remove from the public sphere. But is it sufficiently robust, absent what families and religious communities bring to the table to provide solutions to all or almost all of the important moral and political questions we face? And if not, how are we to settle those? Well, Kuang also acknowledges that the objections have some force, the truth problem in particular just won't go away. Some, he said, and I quote, conclude there is no coherent way to explain how reasonable persons can A, accept something like the fact of reasonable pluralism, B, believe her own non-public doctrine is true, and C, be suitably motivated to endorse a principle of public reason. 
Perhaps that is because they know that virtually all moral or political questions depend to a certain extent on truths about personhood, metaphysics, or human flourishing. That's Kuang again. So what? What do we do then? Must we rely on non-public forms of reasoning and seek accommodations for distinct moral communities in a modus vivendi arrangement of some sort? That's a question that he rightly raises. But who will decide which matters permit or even require this arrangement and which do not? Surely certain basic rules prohibiting non-consensual harming of innocent persons, he says, or protecting certain minimal rights of bodily integrity. You're already sensing the clash between those two uh, expressions. Must be justifiable to all members of the of the constituency of public reason, provided we assume those members are committed to certain minimal ideas of freedom and equality. Even that seems to be hoping for far too much, as we'll see. Without a shared account of the world, concludes Kuang, it might seem the project of public reason faces grave difficulties. Even if certain moral or political rules can be publicly justified, our understanding and application of these rules might radically diverge, given sufficient perspectival diversity regarding what the world looks like. Well, in a globalized world, we have, it's a very large body of people or peoples who will have to achieve sufficient perspectival unity to make the idea work if the constituency is not to reduce to an oligarchy or even to one very strong man who, like tyrants of old, declares that the reasoning public, c'est moi. Wong remains optimistic, but put me down for a pessimist. I don't know if that's Mike Mohanby's influence on me or not. But... <laughs> It seems to me that the whole project of reconceiving public reason, whether in the non-perfectionist way of Rawls or in the perfectionist manner of comprehensive liberals such as Raz, whose inspiration derives from Mill more than Locke, is already showing itself to be impotent in the face of what we call culture wars, in the face indeed of mob violence, whether on the Hill, think Kavanaugh, or in the Vale, think Mrs. Carlson, home alone. Where it is not impotent is in its power to change, to undermine, even to cripple free political institutions such as church and family. Where the family is concerned, we are busy fulfilling Raz's prophecy, or perhaps it was a prescription uh, that he made in the Morality of Freedom uh, back in 1988, when he wrote that. The changes we're undergoing are uncertain and incomplete. I quote uh, from that book at page 393. Some tendencies, for example, to communal families or open marriages may wither away. Others, for example, homosexual families may be here to stay. It's too early to have a clear view of the consequences of these developments. But one thing can be said with certainty. They will not be confined to adding new options to the familiar heterosexual monogamous family. They will change the character of that family. If these changes take root in our culture, then the familiar marriage relations will disappear. They will not disappear suddenly. Rather, they will be transformed into a somewhat different social form, which responds to the fact that it is one of several forms of bonding and that bonding itself is much more easily and commonly dissoluble. All these factors, remember this is 1988, all these factors are already working their way into the uh, constitutive conventions to determine what is appropriate and expected within a conventional marriage and transforming its significance. And indeed, for they are all justified by the morality of freedom from external authority, which in turn justifies itself by reference to what it calls public reason, which doesn't admit of challenges. Let's pause here to observe that it is a mistake to let the mid-level question 
control the upper level question. Religion may or may not produce violence. Nationalism may or may not produce violence. The family may or may not produce violence. But the need to defend ourselves from violence ought not to determine that the family or the nation or the religion of that family or nation should have no place in public reason. Changing the parameters of public reason is not the solution to the problem of violence. It was Hobbes, of course, who sent us down that haunted trail in 1642, and it's high time we exercised the ghost of Hobbes. The need to defeat ourselves cannot justify theft or violence against those who have what we do not. Likewise, the need to defend ourselves against violence cannot justify closing the public square to discourse about improving ourselves that depends upon religion or other robust worldviews. Every attempt to do so is really an attempt to maintain or achieve hegemony for some particular worldview. Catholics and Protestants have tried to do this, and they shouldn't have. Neither should the proponents of liberal public reason. But my point here is that the higher ought to rule the lower. We ought to improve ourselves by devoting ourselves to virtue, which is necessary for happiness. Then, as those learning virtue, see to the defense of what requires defense. and so preserve a space for feeding and clothing ourselves that is a proper human space. If the higher does not govern the Lord, we are not on the path to happiness, which all men ultimately want. We are not living the good life, which is what practical reason, both public and private, aims at. This methodological point made, two possibilities present themselves. Either liberal public reason is the product of cowardice respecting man's higher end, a retreat from higher things, and a desperate attempt to guard lower things, or it is an opportunistic power grab by those who don't believe that man has a higher end. Both, I'm afraid, are in play. Either way, liberal public reason is destructive and to violence, not away from it. Or if it is not permitted to say anything substantive about the good and about happiness, then it is also not permitted to identify and restrain moral failings. And a society that does not identify and restrain moral failings is not a society that makes men better. It's a society that encourages men to be worse. Under the guidance of liberal public reason, we have backed ourselves into a corner in which we are no longer able to think about moral failings in moral terms. Our, our now untrained moral intuitions have become just what Hume and Bentham and Nietzsche and Co. in their different ways all said moral intentions are, mere sentiments, sensations of appreciation or disgust, deployed as instruments of power. At best, aesthetic judgments now largely untethered from a cosmos of goodness, truth, and beauty. Moral chaos has ensued, social and legal chaos as well. Because we cannot talk about God, we cannot talk about man or the created order in which man has been placed. That is, we cannot talk about what man is for, about the end of man, but only about what different men think they want as their own private means to happiness. Because we cannot talk about created order, we cannot talk about what is right, but only about rights. We cannot talk objectively about dignity, only subjectively. We cannot talk about freedom except as autonomy, understood as freedom from the natural authority of others, rather than as responsible self-government. Autonomy no longer means even what Kant thought it meant, namely to be subject to reason. Autonomy now means that I get to decide who and what I am and when I will cease to be what I was or cease to be at all. I do not contribute to that except by your acquiescence to my decision. Even God does not contribute to that. 
the whole economy of gift and givenness on which any functioning society depends disappears. The reasonableness of man disappears. The reasonableness of reason disappears. The claims we make and the policies and laws that we create become untethered even from being itself, from object of reality, as I've tried to show in chapter seven of that new book, uh, Theological Negotiations. Permit me to illustrate this. Uh, I, I'm keeping an eye on my time, I know the time, but uh, I, I, I should finish on time. Let me illustrate by way of the subject between, of the subject behind the subject, rather, of the Kavanaugh hearings, namely abortion. When we began pretending that the fetus was not a human being, rendering it legal to evacuate the body of the fetus from the mother's body, even though that meant the deliberate killing of the fetus, we began, as my friend Daniel Moody has pointed out, a general evacuation of the body itself from public reason and from our body of law. The mother's body still mattered, and so did her life project. But the fetus on the grounds that it had no life project was not even entitled to its body. That's what happens, of course, when you refuse to take the Lord and giver of life into account. If you are incapable of demonstrating that you have a life project, you simply don't count. If, on the other hand, you affirm that your project is over or your attempt at it is over, well, you do count to this extent. You may request help in doing away with your own body. For if you are no project of God's, you are nothing but your own project. Perhaps it won't be long before you are nothing but our project, the project of public reason. Huxley saw that one coming some time ago. Are we surprised that 50 years, roughly, after Roe, the law doesn't know what to do with the body even of the mother? The mother may now say that she is not a woman at all, that she intends to give birth if she does give birth as a man. Anyone may now say such things, and the law will recognize the claim as having legal force. So the law ends up like the fetus, deprived of the body as its reference point, as its instrument, as its means of life. There's nothing by which the law can now measure our claims except those claims themselves. So the law, like the mother or whomever is pushed for the abortion, becomes strictly self-referential. The law, too, becomes solipsistic having deprived itself of the body, which is our God-given means of social communication and organization. The law becomes increasingly arbitrary and irrational. Precedent matters less and less. Facts matter less and less. Non-habeas corpus, let us not have the body. Not even the body. Everything is to be invented anew all the time since there is no created order and no actual givens with which we and it must deal. All rights become autonomy rights, and anything that inhibits autonomy is bad. Family borders, religious borders, national borders fall. They are torn down. Even in the church, we seem to be witnessing a, ter a deliberate tearing down of positive faith and the discipline attached to it. Now, Humani Vitae tried to resist the dismantling of the law of the body, which was already taking place through contraceptive dismantling of the sexual act, the sundering of the unitive and the procreative, that in the creaturely order are in periodic fashion synchronous. And to do that without denying, indeed by reinforcing, the link between practical reason with its responsibility to a hierarchy of goods, both public and private, and responsible procreation. Veritatis Splendor tried for its part to resist the dismantling of moral reason itself, the prizing apart of the body of the moral act, so to say, through the sundering of the intentionality of the act from the act's own objectum or intrinsic ordering. Quote, the rational ordering of the human act to the good in its truth, that's the objective dimension of morality, must not be bracketed off from, quote, the voluntary pursuit of that good, 
the subjective dimension of morality, such that discernment of conscience comes to mean the determination of good and evil rather than recognition of the distinction between good and evil. Had the lessons of these two encyclicals been received by more Catholics, a powerful cultural break might have been applied against the slide into chaotic subjectivity that by 1968, not to mention 1973, was well underway. That slide, unfortunately, had already carried many Western Catholics into apostasy. They thought they were enjoying the good life and being good citizens, but in fact they were sharing in the loss of the good life and in the demise of the public sphere. Loss of the good life, because the good life is a life that leads to happiness, which no life that ignores the designs of God does. Loss of the public sphere, because as I've said elsewhere, no public sphere remains once we have left the body behind and invested everything in the privacy of our minds. Redeeming public reason can only mean returning to the right order of reason, which treats lower things as lower and though capable of homing in on very narrow and specific problems at any and all levels, bracketing out momentarily that which is lower or higher, or even that which is alongside, but only remotely so, never brackets out the higher for any longer than is necessary. If we continue to bracket out the higher, public reason will become impractical and immoral to the point where we will be relieved of our efforts at pursuing it. The strong man will appear, the man St. Paul called the man of lawlessness, to exalt himself against everything divine. For the mystery of lawlessness is indeed already at work, that man well on his way. What can we do to redeem public reason and put it to work in pursuit of the good life? My advice is not very profound or very sophisticated. Rules, they say, are made to be broken. Well, they aren't, really, unless they are profound. The rules of liberal public reason are arbitrary and ill-founded. They are also destructive. So break them. Liberal. Speak of God in public. Speak of the right ordering of the human being and of human life in public. Don't do it piously. Don't do it apologetically. Do it graciously, but do it deliberately. Challenge the cowardice and the contumely. Evangelize your neighbors, your congressmen, and if need be, your judges. Sin boldly, as Luther would say. <laughs> it's always good to quote one of the Pontus' favorite theologians. So. Uh, <clears throat> Your, your opponents know how to do that. Don't underestimate them. And by opponents, I do not mean just those who promote liberal public reason. I mean those who are taking advantage of it to erase all borders. One thinks uh, with Mary Hassan, uh, for example, of, of Shuley Firestone, uh, born up the road here in Ottawa at the end of the war, whose answer to the sexist raging of her father was... Um, something she spelled out in her 1970 book, The Dialectic of Sex, a, a radical Marxist feminist program to eliminate sexual difference altogether, to uproot completely, in her words, the basic social organization, the biological family, to erase all boundaries of sexual behavior, and to see to it, in, again in her words, that gen genital differences between human beings would no longer matter cultural. She was 25 when she wrote that, 1970. How far that program has succeeded, it's astonishing. I mean, I'm not saying that she gets the credit for that. That program is being taught in our primary schools now. We are at war here, spiritually and culturally, whether we like it or not. And we cannot fight, I, with this I conclude, we cannot fight with one hand tied behind our backs, as the proponents of liberal public reason propose. Nor can we let our children be educated or rather brainwashed in this violence against God and nature and man and reason itself. 
Our present position is not much better, frankly, than England's in 1939. The loss of the body is an anticipatory sign of our society's impending doom. So cut the cords of false politeness. Cut also the cords of rage, for we do not fight with the enemy's weapons. But fight we must on the beaches, on the landing grounds, on the hill and in the vale. Fight in and for the church. By God's grace, never give up. Thank you.